Um campo maduro. O pensamento comum enxerga o óbvio. A idade chegou. A energia já não é mais a mesma. Diminuiu muito a capacidade. Não tem tanta utilidade. Quanta besteira. Quanta falta de criatividade. Isso sim é velho. Nada sustentável. Me perdoem por pensar diferente, por querer fazer a diferença. Um campo maduro pode ser sim uma grande oportunidade. Gerar muita produtividade, aumentar a sua longevidade. Só não enxerga quem não quer ou tem medo da adversidade. Por que não ligar dois pontos no meio do mar? O que separa Tubarão Martelo e o Campo de Povo são apenas alguns quilômetros e um pensamento antigo. Que tal um tieback? Unir forças, sinergia. Não foi feito por aqui? E daí? Não vale gastar energia para ser mais seguro, inteligente e sustentável? Queimar fosfato para reduzir a emissão de carbono? O pensamento é uma energia renovável. Isso não tem absolutamente nada a ver com a idade. Petro Rio. Eficiência é o nosso campo. Aqui na Prio nós buscamos aquelas pessoas que além, é claro, do básico, de ser inteligente, de ser talentosa, de ser comprometida, mas acima de tudo pessoas que sonham grande em querer fazer projetos realmente significativos que possam se orgulhar para o resto das suas vidas. O que faz o sucesso dessa companhia são as pessoas, né? e isso de verdade é ligado à conexão entre essas pessoas. Valores como humildade, simplicidade, trabalho em equipe, e ter a consciência acima de tudo que somente o trabalho coletivo ele consegue entregar o melhor resultado, é que faz com que a gente seja mais forte. A seleção de novas pessoas para fazer parte da PetroRio é um dos elementos mais importantes que tem que ser nessa companhia. Né? Pessoas que têm um alinhamento cultural e que têm uma capacidade intelectual, quando juntamos esses dois fatores é que a gente ajuda a companhia a ter os melhores resultados. Para a companhia e para a pessoa que está entrando nela. Hello everybody, my name is Jose Maria Herrera. I am the president of the SPS uh, Unicam Student Chapter. And today I will be the moderator with my colleague Aurev of this course. First of all, I would like to remind that our Kahoot quiz game is available and will be end at uh, five o'clock. Uh, the prizes are incredible and it's so worth participating. Check, uh, check the chat and email access to the link to play it. I want to introduce our guest. It's a really great, uh, great pleasure that we, uh, we will call uh, Professor Larry Lake. Uh, we, uh, before we get started, I would like to make a few reminders to the audience. All opinions of this event refer only to opinions of the speakers and participants and not of the respective companies or even the chapter. Furthermore, if there is an, any illusion of a this discriminatory of nature or reference to social gender or racial discrimination, the, part the participant will be aware that he will be not immediately notified. Don't forget to send your doubts and questions via chat and Professor Larry Lake will answer them at the end of the webinar. For those who intend to obtain a certificate of the course, at the end of the session, a form will be made available to confirm the present. Certificate will be used to those who obtain 75% attends according to the form. And finally, 
Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at SPE Unicamp so you can follow our activities in addition to have so quality information. Now, I would like to give the voice to my colleague, Aurev, to do the presentation to our principal guest. Aurev? Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we can Hello. hear you. So good evening, everybody. I'm Arif Westenman. Today, uh, I'm truly honored and introduce Professor Lake, who is present this presentation uh, with the title of the uh, CO2 and its oil recovery experience and its message for the CO2 storage. Professor Leitch is the Shahin and Sharmullah and Old Chair in the Petroleum Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. He obtained his BSc from Arizona State University and a PhD from Rice University, both in chemical engineering. Professor Larry is a world famous expert in reservoir engineering, geochemistry, fluid pool and process media, and enhanced oil recovery. Professor Lake is the author of many textbooks published by SD, and he uh, received numerous awards from SD, including the Distinguished Service Award, Distinguished Member Award, the Gallery Distinguished Service Medal, and Honorary Membership is the highest recognition award to the SD members. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. Professor Lake has more than 450 publications and more than 21,000 citations. Sure, most of you are familiar with the Postal Lake Roman book, Enhanced Oil Recovery, which include all forms of enhanced oil recovery techniques with both fundamental, principal, and specialized application. So, uh, CO2 has profound impact on our life. Today, every mega project is subject to environmental constraint, and CO2 is the primary cause. Although it can be used to extend oil production in the solar industry, on the other hand, the solar industry can benefit from storing these in reservoir to reduce the impact of green gas. So, a better understanding about this subject, I'm asking Professor Lake to begin his presentation. Professor Lake, please. Good afternoon, folks. Many of the uh, there were many disadvantages from the COVID plague, but one of them is is the fact that we don't get to travel very much. And I uh, remember my trips to uh, Campinas very well. It was a very nice trip and very visit, very good visit. Uh, and today I still am in touch with many of the people that were there at the time. This is a presentation, which I guess I've given many times in the last uh, year. Uh, it must be something whose time has come. The, the title is from CO2, from Lessons for CO2 from CO2 Enhanced Soil Recovery. And as was mentioned, I have been working in enhanced soil recovery uh, for most of my life. I should also say that there are, there are some people that I am indebted to for uh, using their material, uh, particularly the third name of the list, uh, Steve, Steve Bryant, who's at the University of, of Calgary. Uh, and uh, he was a former student of mine that very, very helpful on this. Let me start off by uh, making some, some very general observations. And the first general observation is an enhanced oil recovery, which is oil recovery by injection of fluids not normally present in the reservoir. The, the first bullet has the most important words. And the most important word is the word oil. It is not gas recovery. We may have enhanced gas recovery someday, uh, but uh, we, we do not have that now. Second bullet says not pressure maintenance or water flooding. And finally, not necessarily tertiary recovery at the end of the road. And this is in parallel to another term that has become popular in the last 30 years, improved oil recovery, which is really enhanced oil recovery plus additional technologies with drilling, production operations, and reservoir characterization. But whatever you call it, I think we all know what it means. It's not water flooding, and not necessarily water flooding, and it is always flow through porous media or reservoir. 
And here is a cartoon of that. I'm indebted to my colleague, Kishore Mohanty, for this slide. The top picture there is a, a small a picture of a rock that shows, this is the scale down here, and it shows the poor grains and the poor, poor, uh, poor bodies here. And below this slide, we will have cartoons for each of the important EOR methods. One of them is chemical methods, which is either surfactants, as exemplified by the tide soap there, uh, and what is not exemplified is uh, the most popular chemical method is polymer flooding these days. The second method is solvent or gas flooding, and in that group will be CO2 flooding, and that is what most of the presentation will be, be about. And the third group is thermal oil recovery. That man right there is actually cleaning his carpet with a, a steam, uh, steam uh, cleaning apparatus right in here. Of, of the three methods in here, most of the oil has been produced by thermal recovery, but most of the popularity of EOR is taking place in solvent flooding right now. So with that as, as an introduction, let me talk about general behavior. This is my favorite slide. It's a slide that has three figures. The, the top figure is oil rate, and you really probably shouldn't say oil and water rate. The middle figure has pressure, and the bottom figure has average oil saturation, and they all have a common horizontal axis, uh, the time axis. And the time axis is divided up into three phases to represent the, the existing three phases of, of the oil production. And there are two important things that uh, should be called out before we go further. Uh, the first thing here is the limiting pressure. That's the pressure that the bottom hole pressure of a producing well cannot go below. That it puts a limit on production. And the second one is up here. The slide says EL, most people call it the economic rate, but it is the, the, the oil rate at which the revenues equal the costs of operating, which is called the economic limit. And both the one down here and the one up here have a lot to do with determining how long these phases are. Now understand I'm showing this as a generic behavior. I uh, probably can't find a single reservoir in the world that, uh, uh, that uh, actually, actually follows this, mainly because most reservoirs have more than one well. And I am looking at it as though there is just one or two wells here. So. Let's start off. Primary recovery normally consists of a phase in which the production rises. That's basically a development or exploration phase in here. It's followed by a constant rate phase, a so-called plateau production, and then by a much longer period where the production declines. All of these things up here are governed by the behavior that's down here. You will notice this is the average pressure, it's the average pressure in the reservoir. This is a pressure in the producer. And of course, at first, the producing well pressure falls very quickly. This is a period known as transient flow. And then after that period is over, which for most commercial reservoirs, conventional reservoirs is very short, then both the average pressure and the producing well pressure fall together. Uh, the time at which the producing well pressure reaches the limiting pressure is the time at which the plateau production up here is, uh, is ended and the decline production uh, uh, produ uh, commences. The uh, oil saturations don't change very much because in this period, most of the recovery is because of expansion of the fluids as pressure declines. So in this period, recovery is very heavily dependent upon how these pressures change. After about 10% recovery, we go into a secondary phase. And this phase is characterized up here now by a second hill or bump in here, which usually, and not like it's shown here on the slide, usually this is actually higher than this one over here. And uh, this is also followed by production of whatever the fluid was that we injected, mostly, mostly water. Many people call this the pressure maintenance phase, and that is true because we are keeping the bottom hole pressure constant at this limit. And 
I think I prefer pressure recovery phase rather than pressure maintenance phase because there now are three pressures. There's a, the, uh, the average pressure of the reservoir, which if you're, sec if you're successful, this pressure will go up. And then there is another pressure corresponding to the injection well pressure. Since this phase also consists of a displacement phase, there also is for the first time a decline in the oil saturation right here. I should like to point out to you that the behavior of the wells in this region right here, the production wells, are what most reservoir engineers would refer to as either semi-steady state or quasi-steady state behavior. Over here, when the pressures become constant, this is the phase of what most people refer to as steady state flow. <clears throat> this phase also is ended when the inject when the production rate becomes about equal to the economic limit, and that commences the third phase or tertiary recovery. Now, in this this region, if we're successful, there is a second bump. Usually, the bump is not as large as the bumps in either here or here, although you will see the ultimate recoveries are about the same. The pressures don't change, and what changes down here is that the chemical interactions between the fluids, between the fluids in the reactor are altered by injecting a chemical. This is called tertiary recovery, and the slide up here at the top shows that we continue producing uh, fluid that was injected although many times this is switched over to a new injectant here at this point. Once again, this period is, is over when we reach the economic limit. Now remember, this is schematic. I think many times these phases are actually terminate when we get close to the economic limit, not when we actually, actually reach it, uh, but it, these are considerations to apply. The typical ultimate recovery for each one of these phases is 10%, 25%, and 10%, this is recovery of the oil originally in place. And from here on out, we're going to be talking only about the tertiary recovery or the CO2 recovery part of, of this diagram. Uh, it is also of interest to note that the time scale does not appear on this axis because it's extremely variable. There are many reservoirs in the United States and elsewhere for which the time from that point to this point is over 100 years. <clears throat> this usually is 10 to 20 years. This usually is 20 to 40 years. And, well, the truth is we don't really know how long this will take now, but uh, this is usually about the same length of time as the primary recovery phase is. Now, this is enough for general behavior. And should we have the opportunity to ask questions, I think I might pause a bit to see if somebody has questions. Most people do not observe the whole period here during their work life because the working life of most people is about, is much smaller than the length of each of these phases. But looking at historic data, you will be able to see that that is, in fact, the same, the case. So this is all based upon chemical interactions here. And this based over here is based upon manipulations of the pressures. Now, we are only going to talk about carbon dioxide or CO2 enhanced store recovery. And we'll move from there over into uh, CO2 storage. This is a cartoon that shows some salient points about both CO2, EOR, and storage. It shows, for example, injection into wells, and that is important to note because there must be injection wells and production wells to do this. This slide shows that it's a vertical well. There are more and more there are horizontal wells used in this, in this recovery. And it shows we've injected CO2 over here. It displaces. And Usually we inject CO2 and water together, the so-called bag process. It displaces the oil, forms a bank, a miscible bank, and that actually shows up in the production well over here. Now, for the purposes of this talk, there's a couple of things that need to be called out. There's all those many, many things that could be said here. The first one is up here where it says recycle CO2. As we'll say, we'll see typically about half of the CO2 produced 
is in fact extracted and re-injected, so-called recycled CO2. And that's actually a really important element of the economic behavior. When I move over here, it shows the source to purchase CO2. And this slide is showing one of a variety of sources. Most of the purchased CO2, most of the CO2 used in the United States is naturally occurring CO2. Uh, but there is and there probably will be at a trend toward using so-called anthropogenic sources. That means from a power plant or from a, a cement plant or things like that. Now, that's a small part of the process right now, but it is, it is probably growing. I can show on the next slide that there's a substantial amount invest, of investment in this uh, in, the, in this process, and you can see these are just uh, photographs of compressors, the gas plants, injection well, and all of these are there to uh, uh, to uh, raise the pressure of the of the injected CO2 up to a desired pressure in the reservoir. The gas plant is there to actually separate out the oil from the CO2 and the injection well here and there. You, if you look carefully, you can actually see there's insulation on the injection well, uh, which means that the uh, that there is a, some thermodynamic effects that uh, go forward. Just a second. Okay. So this just gives an an, an idea of what's required to uh, uh, what's required to do a CO2 flood. There's a lot of equipment, and frankly, I'm really surprised by the one in the upper left hand corner. People are always adding more compressors to to extend the life of their CO2 floods. I mentioned that uh, most of the CO2 flooding in the U.S. is taken from naturally occurring CO2. And this is a slide that is intended to show the, uh, the occurrence of naturally occurring CO2 around the world. You will notice there's just one place down here in South America. Many places over here in the United States where we have been uh, taking CO2 from the ground and injected into West Texas for a long time. 50 years you will see as we get to it. But as you look across the rest of the world, there's some places which seem to have very little, like the Middle East or Africa, or even down here in, uh, in Australia. And I, I personally think there's no reason geologically for the United States to have more CO2 than any place else in the world. What I suspect is, is that you have not actually, actually explored, or these other countries have not had to explore for CO2 yet. If I remember correctly, the offshore play here in Brazil has a lot of CO2 in the oil originally. So that's a source that could be used for CO2 EOR. Uh, <clears throat> it's not shown on the map. Okay. So a little background, <clears throat> CO2 bail background. <clears throat> in the first place, we are going to talk almost exclusively about CO2, but there are many different types of solvent, the most common in the U.S. Outside the U.S., it's not quite so true. The most common solvent is usually uh, enriched in, in natural gas. <clears throat> the idea behind CO2 flooding is to increase the capillary number by inducing miscibility. At the same time, it also increases mobility ratio. That means that the CO2 is more mobile than the oil being displaced. And that is actually not a good thing. So the process is a competition between this process and that effect right here. When I say miscibility, it means that we reach a state where there's no interface, interface between the oil and the CO2. And we know that there are several different types of it. There's first contact, developed miscibility. And we know that miscibility is determined by pressure higher the pressure is, the more likely it is to be miscible with the oil. Intermediate hydro hydrocarbon content, basically the lighter the crude oil is, it, the more likely it is to develop miscibility with CO2. Temperature, curiously enough, the higher temperature is, the less likely it is to develop miscibility with the CO2. And I think I mentioned solvent top type and one thing that is always in the background of these processes is the sweep is largely poor because of the mobility ratio being large. 
I'll touch on all of these as we go through here. I just wanted to put them on the table for you. So, first of all, properties of CO2. This is a diagram that I'm sure many of you have seen. This is pressure versus temperature. And it shows regions in here in which the regions are, the, the area is divided to a liquid region, vapor region, solid region, and important points here are such things as the critical point and the triple point. And the main point here is to point out to you that uh, that has a high, CO2 has a high critical temperature, which is here, but a low critical pressure. And that means the region of operation for most floods is up in here, which means that CO2 is actually a supercritical fluid or liquid, not a gas. Another diagram that kind of emphasizes that, here's a plot of the Z factor, the real gas compressibility factor versus pressure. I'm sure you've seen these plots too. There are different temperatures in here that show uh, the temperature and pressure of the measurement and then the horizontal axis here is pressure. And what I've done here is I've superimposed on this plot the pressure and temperature variation according to normal gradients, which are over here, and according to which are over here. And you can see that anything above the 2,600 pounds or, or thereabouts is uh, definitely uh, in the supercritical range, not the gas range, which would be, be up here. An interesting thing about that, which is shown on the next slide, <clears throat> the left plot shows the density of CO2 versus pressure and many different uh, temperatures. And the right plot shows the viscosity of CO2 versus pressure and many different temperatures. And the red curves show the behavior of pressure with depth. And a very curious thing is that when CO2 reaches above about 2,500 feet depth, its viscosity is pretty constant. And its pretty, the viscosity is pretty close to the viscosity of oil which means with respect to density, it's like an oil. And in fact, it's 0.7. And the same thing is true over here with viscosity. Its viscosity as a function of depth is about 0.06. And it really doesn't matter what, uh, where the oil, where the reservoir is, CO2 density under operating conditions will be about 0.7 grams per cubic meters, uh, grams per cc and its viscosity will be about 0 0.06 centipoids. In other words, don't spend a lot of time measuring it. So I mentioned also that uh, CO2 depends on miscibility. And here is a cartoon that shows a, a, a common way to measure miscibility, something called a slim tube test. You take a tube that has a fairly long and fairly thin, packed with grass glass beads. And here's an example of one that's in our laboratory here. And then we conduct a series of experiments, our different pressures, and we show <clears throat> we show that there is usually a place where the recovery levels out, and that pressure is called the minimum miscibility pressure. Now, of course, if we're talking about CO2 storage only, there is the miscibility pressure is not relevant. But as we get to the end of the presentation, I hope to make a case for you that there is a good opportunity for both doing CO2, EOR, and storage. And just to repeat what I said a few minutes ago, miscibility is determined by the things that you, you see there. So... One of the questions that has always bothered me has to do with the field issues, because as we know, and as we saw briefly a few minutes ago, the pressures in most reservoirs are not constant, not constant spatially or even constant temporally. So here's a plot that shows the distribution of pressures at one of the more famous CO2 floods, the, the Sackrock field. And here are regions over in here in which large regions, so large parcels of the reservoir are below the minimum miscibility pressure. And basically, a non-uniform pressure distribution could in fact account for why there is such variability in performances of the wells. 
it could account for, in fact, it does cause a call a time cause a time varying oil oil composition, so that it might be true that CO2 flood is miscible, say, here. After a period of production, the composition of the oil has changed and it now becomes immiscible. Always things to worry. And finally, as a subset of the previous comment, is that in, in all of these floods, there always seems to be a, an enrichment of methane. Uh, for some reason, when we strip out CO2 at the surface, we do a poor job of stripping out methane and from the CO2, and that is when reinjected causes uh, methane to uh, increase uh, in, in the reservoir. Methane is not a good developer of miscibility, so this basically is a temporal enhancement of uh, temporal embodiment of, of the loss of miscibility. For me, it's equally important to talk about flow properties. And so we'll talk about volumetric sweep. This is basically just a very short itemization of the things that affect volumetric sweep. And I'll go through the most important one of these on a couple of slides right now. So the first one is aerial sweep. Now in my mind, I'm not sure it's it's worthwhile to make a distinction between these different types of sweep efficiencies, but they make for good cartoons. And so here is uh, a vertical injector and a vertical producer. And looking down on the reservoir, the aerial sweep efficiency is a heavily shaded area here, divided by the sum of the lightly shaded and, and heavily shaded area. And down at the bottom is a plot of aerial sweep efficiency, what I just said, versus the volume of fluids injected. And you can see the more fluid you inject, the higher the sweep. But what used to be seems to be of most focus is <clears throat> and the higher the mobility ratio is, that means the, the more viscous the oil is, the higher the mobility ratio is, the lower the recovery. A factor of two, maybe in this case here, and one of the things that contributes to this is one of the most interesting things in fluid dynamics. When we inject solvent into a reservoir, we imagine it forms a, a smooth displacement front, but that's just not true. Uh, any, any imperfection in the reservoir, they're always, always there, uh, forms these dendrites or fingers, which makes the aerial sweep even worse than in, in its absence. The second is vertical sweep, and I've studied this one quite a bit, but this one is a, a cross-sectional area that shows a layered reservoir. And the vertical sweep is actually the heavily cross-hatched area divided by the double cross-hatched area. And as the figure below shows it, shows one of the, uh, uh, one of the reasons that causes vertical sweep to be poor is that the injected fluid if it is lighter than the oil tends to uh, tends to move to the top of the reservoir and causes the sweep, the swept area here to be at the bottom to be, uh, to be pretty small. And we just saw that the density of CO2 is more like the density of oil. So when this occurs, most likely it's because the density of CO2 is much smaller than the density of water, which is definitely present there. And, and even though it's not widely acknowledged, it does seem like gravity segregation as indicated by the slide here is important. And it also seems like that's true in CO2 storage because the density difference between CO2 and water will be greater than the density difference between CO2 and oil. Another thing that, uh, that affects the vertical sleep efficiency is this diagram here, which shows something called a Dijkstra Parsons coefficient. And that basically is a measure of the variability of the layers here. And the top one here is a measure of how layered the reservoirs are. In fact, the ones that are actually showed here would have a very high um, uh, layered reservoirs. And the diagram is divided up into three regions, one in which uh, the displacement is is dominated by fingering, a second region in which the displacement, a displacement is dominated by dispersion. And most importantly, because this is where most field floods fall, is a region in here which is dominated by channeling. Channeling is a combination 
of bypassing caused by heterogeneity and bypassing caused by the uh, uh, bypass, bypass caused by the uh, mobility ratio. So basically sweep in efficiency conclusions. <clears throat> and I just want to really let you look at that. Uh, I think the first and the, th and the fourth one are the most important for our purposes. I don't know if I already said that, that gravity segregation occurs in storage, uh, but it does. That sweep is dominated by channeling, combination of fingering and heterogeneity, and mobility ratio is very important to sweep. Now let me move subtly then over to actually field performance. And I, show, I am sure you are aware that the last several years there has been a major an increase in temperature globally around the world. This shows that increase in temperature from the National uh, the, the U.S. Weather Bureau, NOAA. Uh, it's measured up in, in Hawaii and you can see these are the uh, these are the fluctuations that shows that the temperature over the period of measurement has gone up. This is a temperature change. It's gone up a little bit less than one degree and shows no sign of going, going down. At the same time and on the same plot, thanks for Mohan Kelker for this, we've put the CO2 measurement uh, over here, and I said that backwards. The CO2 is measured in Hawaii. Uh, the temperature measurement is measured all over the, all over the world. And I don't have one plotted against this other, but you can see how it would work. There would be substantial fluctuations, but there's no doubt that they're both going up together. So <clears throat> what's become a little harder for us to swallow in the, uh, in the hydrocarbon business is that the CO2 is largely produced by burning fossil fuels. I think I could show a plot that had uh, uh, a fossil fuel consumption on the vertical axis here. It would look a little bit like that. And Unfortunately, this has been going on for a long time, since the, the beginning of the first Industrial Revolution, 1IR. <clears throat> and one thing that is, should always be borne in mind, and if this is something which bothers me all the time, is that CO2 released is correlated with an increase in standard of living which is to say the standard of living is correlated with hydrocarbon consumption. And so our trick is try to find out some way to not let the CO2 go up without at the same time compromising our standard of living. That's why we have a lot of bright young folks out there studying this problem. Now moving forward to CO2 sources, this is CO2 source, sources now. I think I have mentioned that there were many sources, and so here's a kind of a cartoon of them. And on the side of it here, <clears throat> I've listed the various, the various sources. Power plants, especially coal-fired power plants, have an affluent that is somewhere between 3 to 8 percent CO2. Cement plants have an affluent that is about 30 percent CO2. This one actually is overlooked a lot, but there is there are a lot of cement plants in the world and they generate a lot of CO2. Steam methane reforming is often overlooked too. It's not as big as some of the others, but they generate a pretty pure CO2 stream. Ethanol plants over here generate an almost 100% pure CO2, but unfortunately they are they are not very numerous. Refineries are quite numerous. They, they're generation of the CO2 is much like the power plants up here. Ammonia plants are fairly common too and they generate a very pure CO2. And then finally this category here, planes, trains, and buses. Uh, the truth is we're not looking too much at that in sources because they are all distributed sources. And it's difficult to imagine how one could capture CO2 from millions of cars. Although I do note that we've managed to install catalytic converters into most cars around the world right now. So it might be something to think about. Whatever the case is, we are looking at power plants as the main, the main source of reduction for CO2. And of course, everybody will talk about storage. 
So this is the global CO2. This is from Libby US and Lebescu. And it shows the storage projects are largely in North America and Europe. A few more in South Asia Pacific and really not very much uh, below in the, in the southern, southern hemisphere. So this is actually a target for us to look forward to. Now, I, I need to make a couple of comments here because <clears throat> a lot of times operators will count a, a project which is just in the design phases as being on the boards. So when we say CO2 storage projects are 36 in the North America, there are probably only less than 10 that have actually injected CO2. And that might even be more disparate either here or over here. But I hope to make, as we get through the presentation here, we can store CO2 by, by recovery oil too. So let's now turn back briefly to CO2 EOR. Here's our experience with wells. Well, we've had 50 years of operating experience with injectors and we know we can do it, okay? Despite the fact that people will say that we don't know whether we can inject, we know we can do it. We know there are problems, but there are no major problems. <clears throat> and uh, one interesting thing about uh, producing CO2 is that, of course, if we inject CO2, we can maintain the pressure. But if we just store CO2, it's always going to be increasing pressure. And that might be a limit to how much we can store. And then the reason we have had relatively few problems with the injectivity is because, as the bottom, the bottom bullet says, there have been special treatments designed, devised to maintain injectivity. Now, that's basically talking about experience with wells. Uh, we've had almost as many experiences with extract extractors, and the same comments are true. There are isolated cases of injectivity and productivity problems, but none that has stopped the project. So let me move on to field performance. And you might have noticed this is a slide that, uh, that I showed you at the first of the talk. You know, if you'd like to read about it, this is in the Greenhouse Gas Technology Conference that was held in, this is 2018, four years old, uh, in uh, Melbourne, Australia. And so I'm going to go through a series of example performances and go through some aggregate performance and then draw some conclusions. And so <clears throat> the first one I'm going to show you is CO2 EOR performance. This is a plot that shows oil rate here. That's the green curve. And gas oil ratio here, which is the yellow curve. And the first thing, before I get into it, is please note that the rates are small. This is, is a pilot project. So it was, I think there was only four wells in it or something, and that's it. as a consequence, the, uh, the, uh, the rates are small. Now, we've gained so much experience over the years that there are not many pilots now. There are projects that are designed basically by type curve analysis and things like that, but Notice CO2 injected beginning in 1977. Now the, now the plot actually starts here back in 1972 because it seems curious at, at this stage, but there was a legitimate fear back then that you could not recover oil that had been previously water flooded. And so the operators on this flood, and it was Amico, actually conducted a water flood. It shows classic behavior, it shows a rapid rise in uh, the rate uh, slow decline, and then it shows the, the collapse of the gas oil ratio as the pressure pressure is 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 raised. So it, it demonstrated the feasibility of CO2 EOR after water flood. Now moving ahead a little bit to CO2 storage, it also suggests that it, uh, CO2 is displacing water. It's a little hard for me to believe that this is true, but there are a few people that think the CO2 will not displace water. But it will do that because if I show you other things, you will see that it's produced a lot more water than oil. I mentioned this, this is a typical water flood performance over here. And 
the performance of the CO2, which started here in 76 or so, actually caused the oil rate to go up. This is called a bank, an oil bank. And the shaded area here is the so-called incremental oil recovery. That's the oil that was recovered in addition to what would have happened by continued operation in here. And this was an exceptionally well-performing flood for a variety of reasons, because this flood produced 25% of the original oil in place. As we will see later, the average performance in CO2 EOR is, is not this good. But other things, this most interesting one, CO, the gas oil ratio began to increase, but it began to increase actually before the oil rate went up right here. So it is almost as though the oil rate is responding to the threat of CO2. But what it suggests to me, and, and frankly, this was a major, <clears throat> a major uh, revelation to me, was that when, that when we do an EOR project, it really isn't a displacement so much as it is a drag which is to say virtually all of the incremental oil is produced with the CO2. There's no clean oil bank as we see on the next example. Very interesting and that gives me a little bit of embarrassment because I wrote that uh, EOR book uh, 20 years ago and it discusses very many places the displacement of CO2 or uh, displacement of oil by CO2 or by chemicals or whatever. And it would appear that most of the actual displacement or recovery in the reservoir is really a drag. Now I'll move to a second case. This is a this is not a pilot, and this is a uh, a CO2 flood. This I think it's the Wasi unit, and I'd like to show you that what a difference in the rates are here. That's a hundred thousand barrels per day, right there. This is a very large field. It just shows the water production, the water injection in here, and uh, much larger oil rates because this is a field flood. <clears throat> this flood is still going on. Operators are still producing oil. But what's of most interest here is that there really isn't a bank. In fact, what has happened here is really the oil rate has stabilized, but it didn't really go up. What it did do did do is it kept the oil rate from declining and once again you can see that the deviation here from the decline occurs almost the same time as we started injecting the CO2. Very interesting. So we do not have to have an oil bank to be successful. Much of the much of this paper, at least the next few slides, is a uh, is based upon some data that I got from Mike Stell at Ryder Scott. And what you see there is in the form of incremental oil recovery on the vertical axis, fraction of original oil in place versus injected CO2 as a percentage of hydrocarbon pore volumes. And I suspect you can't read the legend and it won't be important to read the legend because we'll talk about aggregate behavior. And what we need to see here is a substantial variability in performance. Oil response was again very quick. Several large pore volumes injected. Many, many floods had over uh, almost 100 pore volume, uh, 101 pore volume of injection. And the ultimate recovery was highly variable from a low of 7 to a high of 25%. Now, what I probably should have showed here is that this data set was remarkable in the sense that it actually gave uh, it, it actually gave produced CO2. I don't have the slide right here, but I will refer to it several times in the presentation. And I will go forward. And so this is the aggregate performance. Now, the curves on the previous slide that were, that were highlighted are actually on this slide by the light gray lines in here. And what we've done is we fit these things to a mathematical model and using the mathematical model, a very simple one, talk about it in just a minute. Uh, we are able to, to not only estimate the average performance here, but we're also estimate, use, able to estimate performances that is one or two standard deviations above, above or below the mean. So substantial, substantial variability in performance and you should expect substantial variability among wells. So it's good, good to do a good project. 
because that really variability tends to get uh, wiped out. And I, this is not a great slide for showing it, but floods, floods that respond quickly t tend to have small, or smaller ultimate recovery. And that's consistent with, con consistent with the fact that they are channeling or bypassing uh, the reservoir. And the maturity of the process is, is, is again evident. It's upwards, and now the, the plot down here is showing water plus CO2 injection. You can see there are several floods that have injected over four, over four poor, poor volumes of fluid, even at this time, and they're still going, they're still going. So it's a very mature process. Often recovery is five to fifteen percent, and uh, there's still a lot of oil left behind because the bedding was is that the oil saturation was somewhere around, oh, probably uh, 60 to 80 percent when the flood started, and we got 10 percent of it, and so there's still a lot of it there. So there's still a substantial amount of oil replacement uh, even after CO2 flooding. Here's a flood, flood. Here's a slide that is supposed to show you, uh, uh, illustrate the, uh, the behavior of the, of the production of CO2. In the upper left-hand corner, I so we show cumulative versus time. And this is a plot that showed the injected CO2. This is a straight line. It doesn't have to be a straight line. But below it, it shows the produced CO2. And after a while, you know, at first, there's not much produced. But after a while, the injected and the produced CO2 lines become par uh, parallel. And the difference between these two is the amount of CO2 that's retained in the reservoir. Now, I got to say, <clears throat> it's hard to find production of CO2 data. So this particular data set was quite unique in that respect, and it allows us to make some conclusions later on. So these are the actual behavior. Across the horizontal axis is the CO2 injected, and one in poor volume, and the vertical axis is the CO2 produced. That's this curve here. And over here on the lower left-hand corner, is the CO2 injection and the CO2 retained. That's this part right here. And you can see <clears throat> that there's a substantial retention. In fact, the average here is about 40%. And I think it's probably, it's probably an accident, but that re ultimate retention of CO2 is not much different than what the residual oil saturation of oil was, the residual saturation of oil was before the project began. So, <clears throat> here going back to it, this is the plot, CO2 retained versus water produced, and conclusions is CO2 replaces the oil volume, but it also produce, mixes and produces water volume. And the lesson is that CO2 EOR can store CO2, about a, a volume equal to about the residual saturation of oil. So as we get to the end, let's do a typical Steve Riot plot. And let's show the differences between carbon capture and storage on the left and the carbon the CO2 EOR on the right. And so here are the comparisons. Well, the biggest difference, the one that we're all worried about, is the CCS has really no revenue associated with it. But CO2 EOR's motivation is profit-driven. CCS and CO2 EOR both deal with multi-phase flow. In the CCS case, it's uh, CO2 and water. In the CO2 EOR case, it's CO2, water, and oil. CCS, and this is a, something that a lot of people talk about, CCS, if we're thinking about storing it in aquifers, it has no proven trap, right? Whereas uh, CO2 EOR has a field demonstrated trap, no trap, no oil. So it must be there, and that gives a pretty strong uh, evidence of, of uh, there being oil there. CCS has injection wells. But CO2 EOR has both injection and production wells. CCS is a semi-steady state operation. This is a comment that goes back to the early slide I showed in the presentation.
that when you have things that are only injection or only production, your operating mode is semi-steady state. But CO2 EOR tends to be steady state. And that's a good thing because that actually bleeds off any attempt or any in the tendency to, uh, to build up uh, excess pressure in the reservoir. CO2 is captured and injected in a CCS project, but it's also done for CO2 EOR. Now, to be sure, the naturally occurring CO2 is often very pure, so there isn't much uh, purification there. But since a lot of the stream is actually re-injected CO2, it also has to be produced, separated, and re-injected. So that's really no different than uh, CO2 EOR. CO2 is port purchased is the difference uh, in this part over here. Now, I've become a pretty big believer of using simple models to understand uh, behaviors in the, in the field. And so what I've done here is I've kind of reproduced the uh, reservoir that we showed you earlier, but I'm not drawing a distinction between aerial sweep and vertical sweep. I'm just going, going to call it all volumetric sweep. I'd like to point out to you that aerial sweep, as this slide suggests, is part of volumetric sweep. And it goes up as the more you inject, and it goes down as the higher the mobility ratio is. The volumetric sweep is here. So the cumulative oil produced is the change in oil saturation, that's between here and here, times the volumetric sweep times the pore volume. I forgot to talk about this figure over here. This is an interesting figure, too, which shows the vertical sweep efficiency versus the Baxter Parsons coefficient with different mobility ratios here. And these calculations use something called a Cobol factor, so that in truth, there's only two parameters here. One parameter is the change in oil saturation, and the second parameter here is a Cobol factor, which characterizes the volumetric sweep. It characterizes in the following fashion. Uh, these are just plots of an equation. The equation below it is from the 1963 paper by Koval that showed that you could actually represent the volumetric sweep with a very simple relationship. Here's the dimensional time. Here is the Koval factor, and it gives curves which have the same shape as this part over here. Very easy to history match with this. So to make you see how it works, this is the plot. This is the oil recovery here versus the cumulative oil water injected. Here's CO2 versus cumulative oil water injected. And the dotted lines on these curves were matched to the field data by the simple two-parameter model that was on the previous slide. I think that's pretty good. Not bad for one afternoon of work. Good matching. So one of the messages here is that you can do these things pretty well with simple models. So simple model matches two parameters, and still there's substantial variability in performance, and still the, still the CO2 response is very quick. I uh, am a little hesitant to show tables in presentations like that, but I think it's important because, first of all, it gives you the names of the fields, over here. Second of all, it points out that all of these floods were lag floods. They injected anywhere between four times and basically amounts equal to CO2 into the flood. Over here is the recovery efficiency, which is calculated from the data by Crowball. And here, in fact, is the oil saturation change, which is here. Now, I frankly think this number is a little high. I mean, so I don't think it should be these, these high, but that's what the match of the data show. So it shows basically the ultimate recovery, which is over here, is equal parts due to the local change in saturation, this column, column and the volumetric sweep efficiency, which is this column. I actually thought that the volumetric sweep efficiency would be a much bigger contributor, but it's pretty big anyhow. There's also some question as to why this oil saturation in the sweat zone is so, so large. And so here's a possibility, is that this is a cartoon of uh, 
and this I think is a, a simulation of the mobility ratio equal to one simulation. This is the same simulation that shows viscous fingering. But in addition to the fingers, this is a volumetric sweep, you will notice that there's lots of regions in here that are swept, but the oil recovery is not complete. And so I've had students take a look at this, and it seems like that that swept that uh, lack of lack of recovery in the swept zone has about equal uh, amounts because of dispersion characterized by this slide here this is the miscible saturation in the swept zone and because of loss of miscibility i showed you a slide about that uh, before uh, even if we think the whole reservoir is above miscibility pressure it's it's not but i come now to the very most important slide in uh, the whole presentation, and that is, are we really storing CO2? And I'm sure this has crossed your mind because you say to yourself, yeah, okay, I'm convinced we can recover oil, but I also know that nearly all of that oil is burned somewhere, either for gasoline or through process plants or through diesel or something like that. In fact, that's really true. It's about 80% of the uh, crude oil produced from reservoirs is burned. And that burning itself produces CO2. So surely, surely, we're producing more CO2 than we are storing. So I give to you a figure which I'm not entirely sure about, but I'm going to do it. This is a plot of CO2 utilization ratio. That's the standard cubic feet of CO2 retained per stock tank barrel of oil uh, produced. And it shows, as usual, a lot of variability. But curiously enough, when we get here toward the end, there isn't so much variability. I don't know why that would be true. And it turns out to be <clears throat> we store about 7 MCF of CO2 for every incremental barrel recovered. Now, down here are conversion factors that actually put this on a on a uh, on a equivalent basis, I'm, I'm all, I've checked this calculation many times, but if anybody sees an error in it, please let me know. But if I use the average value here, it turns out to be one pound, one per one. A gram of CO2, a kilogram of CO2 stored for every kilogram of CO2 released. That's amazing to me. That is absolutely amazing to me. And that means that we could actually do a little bit of both. We could actually make some money while we're storing CO2. Because, and this is an important point to remember, none of those floods were designed to store CO2. Those floods were all designed to produce oil. And it is possible that a small change in the design could make this number maybe two, maybe three, which would actually make it much more attractive as a CO2 storage project and make a little money. Now, I'm toward the end of the presentation, so let me begin to, to, uh, to sum up. First of all, the title of the talk was From Maturation to, uh, uh, to uh, Maturation and to Migration. So let's talk about lessons learned because of the maturity of the process. The first one is it's a 50 year old project. Uh, I think I say 50 years, but people tell me it's actually older than that. University Block 31 in West Texas might be 70 years old. <clears throat> the second is most CO2 in the US is from natural sources. Third is rapid response. We don't have to wait we don't have to wait for, you know, for, for five poor volumes of injection. This is very different from the steam flood. Steam flood takes a lot of injection to get, to get it out. Most of the oil is produced with the CO2. There's no, well, there might be banks, but even if there's banks, it comes, the CO2 comes out with the oil. This means we must always be prepared to separate at the surface. Formation of oil banks is not necessary. This next point, probably I am stretching my ability to uh, conclude here, but we don't see any great sensitivity to formation types. 
I believe this is true, but I think the reason why it is true is because nearly all of the floods in that data set were uh, West Texas, San Andres carbonate floods. But I believe it's true that we'd not see a great difference between, uh, say, a sandstone reservoir or a carbonate reservoir. Ultimate recovery average is 11%. You're taking notes. That's 11% of the original oil in place. I didn't really emphasize this very much, but I could do it. About half of the CO injected is recycled, which means that about half the CO2 injection is stored. Biometric sweep efficiency is poor. Yes, so true. But remember, there's other solvents besides CO2, but the subject of the presentation here is CO2 storage and, and EOR. Well, let's talk about uh, migration, okay? And I think this is my last slide, yeah. Maybe, maybe not quite. First of all, many oil field technologies are transferable from CO2 to CCS. Anything that has to do with injection wells, anything that has to do with geology or simulation, all that is transferable. In fact, you can actually say anything that doesn't have to do with oil is transferable. Now, I think that's a funny thing to say that, that we're talking about CO2 EOR, but we're saying anything that doesn't have to do with oil, the whole reason for being was oil was, of the process was to recover oil. There are no detectable cap rock breaches. Uh, there might be some people that argue with me because I know you can move a monitor around the surface of the CO2 flood. You'll see, uh, you'll see uh, uh, elevated, uh, you'll see uh, elevated uh, amounts of CO2, but that might come from the wells. There's few surface leaks, and it means. Although we're really in the learning stage right now, it means that this is minimal, minimal monitoring requirements. This slide says different time scales between CCS and CO2 EOR. And I'd like to point out the reason that is so is because the, the actual injection period between CCS and EOR is about the same. It's about 10 to 30 years or so. But CO2 EOR has got kind of an incubation or shut in period that is considered to be several hundreds of years. And so the time scale for that process is much longer than it is for CCS. CO2 EOR is subject to volume, small volumetric sweep because of the large CO2 mobility and formation heterogeneity. Not as large, not as small as I thought it would be, but uh, nevertheless there. And it will prove to be that the nature of external boundaries is important. I mean, we'll find ourselves trying to find the edge of reservoirs or the edges of aquifers, and we'll be much more concerned about where those edges are in uh, trying to store CO2 than we did for EOR. And simple models can, predict, can, can fit production data. Source of CO2 is different. And oil is an object of commerce. I would ask you to look up at the price of oil today. You can still sell it. And it might be, it just might be that you could actually generate oil, pay for CCS, right? And, uh, and actually make a little profit or at least make it even so that we don't have to rely so much on subsidies and taxes and things like that. But an interesting thing is, the major barriers to this are political and economic. They're not technological. I mean, we've been injecting CO2 in the reservoir for more than 50 years. We've seen all the evidence of that before. And yes, it's a substantial achievement. There is no doubt. But we know how to do it. So the biggest barrier to storage is political will and last but not least, economics. And I'm hoping that second from the last bullet there will help us out on, on the economics. Speaking of which, this is my last slide. 
how do we do a CO2 EOR project where we emphasize the storage as much as we emphasize the oil recovery? Well, here's some suggestions. And maybe you have some other thoughts too. If you do, please send me an email. But one thing you can do is just lose the wag. Let's stop injecting water. Just inject CO2. Yes, I think we'll lose some recovery. I think that recovery will be more than compensated by the additional CO2 stored. So no more wag. Second, do anything you can do to free up pore space, right? And I'm alluding here to a very common practice in the U.S. that is to take the produced water and put it back into the same formation. Why not take the produced water and find a disposal well or a disposal formation so that that pour volume in the in the CO2 ERR project is, is able for storage and then use mobility control agents. This actually has become common practice in in oil recovery as well. So I am finished. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about that one. Don't inject produced water into the same reservoir. And that's the end. I should be very pleased to answer questions. Uh, <clears throat> okay, thanks you, Professor Lake. We're going to see the comments and some questions that we the people are uh, writing in the in the comment sections. I, I will let you read them to me. Okay, here uh, Farid Shekaria said. Hello, I don't know. Wait, wait. Hello, Fareed. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He, he he's writing now. Okay. But he 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 left a comment, Doctor Lake. You may remember me, I am Farid Shakaria, in the Brazil and Presal in the super giant Mero Tupi and Bosia fields. The CO2 is separated from natural gas and rejected in a water stream. He also said there are huge volume being, being, uh, being injected. Unfortunately, I don't have any numbers now. That's good to know. If you do have numbers for read, I'd be happy to see them. Okay. Uh, there, oh, Joans Marco Fontinile, he said, how, how the project of CCUAs are influenced by the oil price? <laughs> Very good question. They are very strongly influenced by the oil price. And, and uh, I think the second or third slide, I showed one with the economic limit on it. And the economic limit is heavily dominated by the oil price. So the higher the oil price is, the lower the economic limit, and the longer the projects can, can, uh, can go. And in fact, not only can the projects go longer, you can actually start new projects, some of which could be CO2 EFR. So yes, in most calculations, mine, my students, people that I know of, that's the most significant uncertainty. Uh, there's, there, there is an, a new question about with, uh, Juan Nicolás Autiva said, Professor, good afternoon. I would like to know in general terms how much could increase the oil volume in reservoir to the CO2 swelling? Yeah, that's a good question too. You all, you all have good questions. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, there's some correlations in the literature on that. And, and I must say, as I get older, I become more and more suspicious of, uh, of laboratory correlations as applied to the field. But uh, I will say that in, you're, you're thinking about a, a a swelling as a recovery mechanism, and that's probably okay for low pressure CO2. It's usually around 20% to 30% increase in things like that. But if you can develop miscibility, that is by far the most important mechanism. Here we are a comment with, uh, from Marcelo Sampieri. He said, thank you for the excellent presentation and left a question. One challenge that CO2 brings to its compositional characteristic is modeling it with tools with like CRM or even conventional reservoir simulator for history matching or forecasting purpose. Yeah. 
the question. And the question is, how do you deal with, especially using the CRM tool that you use to that you know to work so well? Uh, well, we have we have not used it very much for CO two. We've used it, I think, once or twice, and uh, I'm I'm surprised that it works. Uh, and frankly, uh, uh, the reason it works is because CRM is based upon reservoir barrels, and it doesn't matter whether it's a reservoir barrel of CO two or a reservoir barrel of water. Water, they it's based upon the notion of filling up the pore space, and it doesn't matter how it works. Now we can, and we've done this, but not very much. We can merge on to it the, uh, the COVAL uh, method that uh, I alluded to in this slide, and it gives pretty good uh, uh, pretty good agreement with data. Now, you know, CRM is a data-based uh, process, which is really good these days. We're always talking about data-based models, but the downside is you have to have data. So yes, uh, it seems successful, but uh, we still have to have data. Okay. Uh, here we are another comment from Pedro Aum. Professor Lake, thank you very much for the talk. It was excellent. And the question was, I would like to know if the CO2 injection strategy fire management is impacted by the predominant storage mechanisms, the cellular trapping, solubility, and mineral trapping. Wow, that's a very good question. Uh, we are in terms of trapping of CO2 for storage, we are sort of in the early stages of understanding. And so the best we can do is uh, is do numerical simulation, composition simulation. And to me, mineral trapping is very attractive. I mean, injecting CO2 and having it stored as a, as a calcite. Uh, but most uh, calculations tend to see that as very slow. So that's something that occurs uh, toward the end of the life of the project. And early on, it's trapping as a residual saturation. And to my surprise, traveling, trapping in uh, a, a, an acreage phase. But I still like the notion of mineral trapping. It just seems to be uh, slow. Um, OK. Uh, there is another question from Paulo Ribeiro. Uh, dear Dr. Blake, congratulations for the very nice uh, presentation. Thank you for your contribution to our annual workshop. <laughs> <That was that. laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> there, uh, there is a comment from my professor at UNICAP, uh, Rosangela Barros and Noni Lopez Moreno. She said, Dear Dr. Lake, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. You're welcome. There another uh, comment, Preta Pelo Mundo. Thank you, Professor. And there is a question we, uh, from my colleague, Aurev. He, he said, Professor Lake, and, uh, are the electric cars really reduce the CO production or e or just a prop propaganda from selling them by the car companies? <laughs> Good question. You know, that, uh, that is a question that has been, been uh, heavily debated. And to, to tell you the truth, we don't see much literature on this. And so uh, the best I will do is to pass on a statement to, to you from my colleague, Makul Sharma, who has been studying this as part of a class that he teaches. And he says the electric cars do in fact store CO2 up until about 50,000 miles. And then there's a crossover and they produce more CO2. Now, I'm not sure I can understand that or explain that, but that's what he says. Okay, we I don't know if there are, there are more questions to to ask. Uh, let me see. Going to put up. So uh, I don't know if you we can do do uh, we can take a screen for our activity. If you are the time to, to take a, a photo with us. Sure. <laughs> OK, I'm going to ask to my colleagues, Aurev and Shao Miguel, uh, turn, turn on uh, their cameras. OK. What do I need to do here? Yeah, it's only a smile for the. <laughs> oh, OK, <laughs> you do it, huh? OK. OK, uh, Miguel, you can. Uh, take the screen. 
Oh, there is an, another, another, that's, that's, I, that's, he's my vice president from the chapter. Okay. When you're ready, Miguel. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Ready. Yeah. Uh, thank you, you very much, uh, Professor Larry Lake. Uh, I have a last question. Uh, I would like to. Uh, Hello. Hello. Right. Yes. Can you listen to me? Yes, we can listen to you. It's okay. okay. Perfect. You can, uh, you can talk. I would like to ask uh, the actual geological structure to store dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, are available to store how many years of carbon dioxide production? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't know the answer to that question. It's, it's probably a pretty small fraction of the total production right now. Okay. <laughs> well, I so I am so pleased that you have your time to give a, a lecture for our event. Thank you so much, Professor Lake, uh, and again to the student, the Unicorn Student Chapter. It's honor that you ha have you in our press in, uh, in our workshop. For the people who have seen us, uh, I want to comment that uh, at five o'clock in, in 30 minutes, we will, we will have a, a mini course from WIS Energy. So we are, we're going to wait you to uh, assist that course. It's really interesting. So again, for the special Lake, thanks you so much for having your time. I hope that we can do some other activity in the future. So thank you, I thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. I don't know if you have some words to the people who see you now. Uh, well, not much more. It's just that I guess I'm I guess I'm surprisingly encouraged by this the idea of storing CO two and producing oil. So I I know it's very early and, and particularly with the your assets, but it might be something to think about uh, as you would design the uh, the the production of in, uh, in Brazilian assets. So anyhow, that's good. Thank you very much for your questions. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor. Sure, sure, goodbye. Trabalhar numa empresa multicultural, estar com pessoas de diversos países. Um ambiente extremamente intercultural e poder se desenvolver aqui dentro ao máximo. Você está em contato com gente diferente todos os dias, fazendo coisas diferentes todos os dias, mesmo que você tenha a sua rotina na sua área. Você sempre está em contato com pessoas diferentes, de culturas diferentes, e isso é uma das melhores coisas que uma empresa pode oferecer. Todas as pessoas são muito acolhedoras e receptivas, então a gente sente um conforto quanto ao ambiente. Eu estou tendo a oportunidade de ter contato com diferentes visões, diferentes pessoas, me ensinando coisas que eu não imaginava. A oportunidade de aprender muita coisa sobre diversas áreas, não só na, na minha área de petróleo e gás, mas também na área de negócios. O envolvimento que você tem junto com, com sua equipe, você se sente realmente abraçado por todos. A gente está sendo bastante ouvido. O RH tem trabalhado muito junto com os estagiários e dando a oportunidade da gente criar e trabalhar junto entre si também. Incrível, porque são vários estagiários, então nós conseguimos formar um grupo muito coeso, muito bacana, você consegue se divertir bastante, além do aprendizado.
Então, a integração entre estudante e profissional e também a aplicação prática de toda a teoria que a gente aprende estudando. E também os inúmeros desafios que a gente enfrenta no dia a dia e sempre tem um suporte para conseguir resolvê-los e executá-los da melhor forma. A cada dia eu me desafio. Desde o meu primeiro dia eu fui desafiado a criar um projeto junto com o meu time. E isso me motivou a ir além e a ver o quanto eu sou capaz de evoluir, mesmo em pouco tempo. Ser estagiário na Total Energies é com certeza ter meu futuro agregado. Porque a pessoa que entrou aqui é com certeza diferente da pessoa que eu sou hoje. É uma experiência maravilhosa, muito difícil, desafiadora, mas que traz uma experiência ímpar para minha vida. Ser estagiário da Total Energies, se eu fosse definir uma palavra, seria orgulho. Orgulho de ser parte de um time no qual eu aprendo muito, no qual que também está disposto a aprender comigo. Orgulho de conhecer as pessoas que eu conheço hoje, de ser a profissional que eu me torno hoje e de ser a pessoa que eu venho me tornando a cada dia mais. SNF for easy, cost efficient and sustainable EOR solutions. In a world where the energy demand continues to climb, oil extraction must be done in an environmentally responsible way. For EOR operations, this means reducing CO2 emissions. When changing from water flood to polymer flood, the water production can be reduced from nine barrels of water to three barrels of water per produced barrel of oil. SNF achieves this with modular plug and pump installations for quick and cost-effective unit implementation with many added benefits. Polymer flooding involves increasing the viscosity of injection water to enhance sweep efficiency and ultimate recovery of oil within a deposit. SNF assists clients through every step of the process. From assisting screening and reservoir studies, polymer logistics to on-site storage, mixing and injection. SNF designs, implements and operates on-site facilities for the client. Polymer flooding has a higher added value than water flooding. Due to the greater sweep efficiency of polymer flooding, the overall recovery will be accelerated with significant water production reduction per barrel of oil. Using SNF system, client's water cut went from 90% to 70%, which means three times less water production per extra produced barrel of oil, savings on lifting operation and production costs. These benefits also result in a reduction of up to three times in greenhouse gas emissions during the operations. SNF improves the efficiency of oil production processes. Because polymer flooding is easy to implement and more mature than other methods, development time will be significantly reduced. Sabe o que significa sermos os criadores da manhã? Significa que tudo o que fazemos hoje é para criar a energia do futuro e oferecer uma energia cada vez mais limpa, confiável e acessível para toda a sociedade. Somos a Repsol Sinopec Brasil, uma das maiores empresas de exploração e produção de petróleo e gás natural do país. São 25 anos de história e o pioneirismo de participar da abertura do mercado e do início da exploração do pré-sal brasileiro. E com essa energia de sempre sair na frente, nossa trajetória ESG já é uma grande realidade. E temos muito orgulho dessa história. 
Acreditamos no talento e na igualdade das pessoas e acolhemos a diversidade. Apoiamos a cultura, o desenvolvimento social e a preservação do meio ambiente. Somos parte do primeiro grupo do setor de energia a declarar zero emissões líquidas até 2050. E para fazermos essa energia circular, apostamos em um mercado mais diversificado. Investindo em pesquisas com universidades e empresas parceiras, avançamos em tecnologias disruptivas, ultrapassando as fronteiras da inovação. Produzir a energia que o mundo precisa. Essa é a inspiração que move cada um aqui dentro. Repsol Sinopec Brasil. Há 25 anos, somos os criadores do amanhã.